Now, obviously, this topic is of huge interest, not just in Catalonia and across Spain, but in the whole of Europe, really. It's obviously of particular interest in Scotland. We held an independence referendum in 2014, in which a majority of people voted to remain part of the UK. However, subsequently, there have been repeated calls for another vote. In 2017, the Scottish Parliament voted by a majority to hold another referendum. However, that request was rebuffed by the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, who argued that now is not the time. Now, that put the Yes campaign into a bit of a difficult position. There was some discussion internally. Some people felt that holding a referendum without the backing of the UK government would lack credibility or legitimacy. Others, however, argued that the Scottish Parliament was the primary vehicle to make this sort of decision and they should push ahead. So as you can see, there are obviously some clear parallels between Scotland and Catalonia, at least in that sense. And so the aim today really is to find out a bit more, to hear about how the referendum came about in Catalonia, what happened and what the consequences have been. So the good news is we're joined by three experts who can talk us through this. We're going to have three presentations. Each one should last around 10 minutes and then we should have 25 or 30 minutes of time at the end for you to ask questions and to get some answers back. So our three experts are Mireia Grau from the Institute of Settlement Studies. We have Elisenda Casanias from the University of Edinburgh and Dani Setra from the Centre on Constitutional Change. Now, I'm very aware that the more I talk, the less time we're going to have later for you to put your questions and for you to hear these experts. So without further ado, we're going to jump to the first presentation, which is from Maria. Maria, please. OK, thank you. I hope the sound is OK from my side. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. I see I can't see the audience, but I see the names. So I'm very glad to see some friends there. I will start. We have distributed the presentation, so I start explaining what happened in Catalonia. Between more or less June, when the voting or referendum was called, and the end of October 2017. But let me start by framing my perspective, because I think it's not just a, a development of events, but um, after three years, um, I think it's important to have in mind what happened on um, an umbrella, an analytical umbrella. First of all, I think that um, unilateral or not, referendums, votings or electoral processes have have to do with legitimacy. And this legitimacy has two pillars, let's say, or at least I see there are two pillars, essential pillars. The first one is the institutional guarantees. So the standard uh, processes that make this uh, voting um, Recognize for everybody. And the other pillar is the results, but not just the results, but results link to the turnout. So, in a unilateral referendum voting, this dimension of legitimacy has to be seen in a magnifying glass. I mean, we need to make sure this dimension is absolutely and crystal clear. So, why I'm talking about these two pillars? The first one is the institutional guarantees, which will refer to what this the organizing has already, the existing institutional setting the organizer has to carry on uh, voting that fulfills all these standard processes. Of course, this makes the, 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 the context different. I mean, in some uh, political systems, the regional units have more powers than others in this respect. So it's a question of powers, whether the unit has the constitutional powers to carry on this kind of voting. And secondly, and very important as well, the institutional mechanisms, whether the institutional mechanisms to, to, to establish this um, voting are under the, under the powers of the, the unit that organizes it. Of course, that makes a different departing point. I mean, the cost as well of building up this institutional setting, if it's not existing, is 
more expensive, let's say, than if you already have. So this is important because in the Catalan case, we didn't have the capacity, the institutional capacity to organize a referendum because first, the Spanish government and institutions had um, decided on the court that um, organizing a referendum without, um, with or without consent uh, was not on, on the powers of the autonomous community. So they, there was an, a need of agreement, sorry. And also that the subject of the referendum was absolutely out of the powers of the Catalan government. So of course, starting a, and initiating a unilateral referendum meant starting from a scratch on the institutional guarantees. On what refers to the results, we will see that, um, of course, the, also as a consequence of this enormous, for the immense effort to build up the institutional guarantees, we left aside the results linked to the level of turnout. We'll start with um, the events. After several attempts to negotiate the organizing, organizing a referendum, finally on June uh, 2017, after several months as well of external and internal tensions, the Catalan government uh, called for a referendum on the 1st of October. On which basis? Because as I said, had no, it was repeatedly uh, said from uh, central government, there was no issue of organizing a referendum, no powers, and of course, no institutional mechanism to carry it on with all the guarantees required. The very hostile context that the Catalan government had to decide all these aspects also were framed in a very strictly legal, legal perspective. The Spanish government defined the question of the referendum of the voting as a legal issue and it said repeatedly no, no, no. This is strictly legal perspective also cornered the Catalan government into the same perspective. Legitimacy was understood as a matter of legality. But for states, if you reduce legitimacy to a matter of legality, you can win. But if you're not the state reducing the question to legality, it's not a good idea. So the Catalan government found itself it had to organize a referendum at two levels. First, providing the legal framework and also organizing the logistics. It delegated the logistics to the civil society, which meant that civil society um, is not very well known how they did it, but civil society organized to get the ballot boxes and the ballots. And the Catalan government was left with the providing the legal framework. This legal framework was absolutely a formidable endeavor with no power and no mechanism, as the electoral administration is at the hands of the Spanish government. So the departing point was absolutely weak. There was, there was needed a huge effort to reach the minimum. And cornered into this legal perspective, the parliamentary groups and the government baked a uh, the idea of passing two different laws in the Catalan Parliament. The first one was the law on the referendum, so establishing the procedures of the referendum, and the second one was a law establishing what would happen between the, the presumable results positive so saying that yes to the referendum and the creation of a new state. These two laws were debated in the parliament, in the Catalan parliament in September the 6th and the 7th. There were several um, questionable um, issues relating to the passing of these laws. 
such as it, it was a politically desperate parliamentary debate altered in order to pass laws without um, many modifications. The opposition uh, parties left the voting, so the, the laws were just um, that were passed, but just with the vote of the the groups that were in favour of the referendum. So from from this perspective, the capacity, although the laws were passed, the capacity to provide a legitimate framework to carry on with the process was already shaked. After that, it's true that the, the civil society dimension came to be really important at that point because it seemed that there was a huge mobilization as it was that would promote or at least provide a part of a legitimacy that was that was not acquired by the legal process. But of course the strictly legal perspective of promoting laws that were not debated in the parliament that, that had no support from the opposition parties also provided a very little chance to succeed. So I don't have much time, but um, after all this process of in trying to provide an institutional guarantee to carry on a legitimate voting, ended up on the 1st of October with a huge mobilization given the circumstances, but as a result that although there were 90% of favor, only on the 43% of turnout. So, this unilateral voting lacked legitimacy because it didn't manage to provide the um, institutional guarantees and the results related to the, the level of turnout were not enough. Why all this happened is another question. The result or, or the consequence of all that was this. I think I managed to get him to time. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. But next up, we have Elisenda. Elisenda, are you with us? Excellent. I am, yeah. Thanks very much, Liam. Could you confirm just before that you can see me and you can hear me well? Yes, you're, you're coming across very well. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for for the invitation. It's a pleasure to um, be on a panel with Mireya and um, Danny again to, to discuss these issues. So my brief following on from um, Mireya's very interesting presentation is to um, discuss the legal responses of the Spanish state, of the Spanish authorities to the kind of Catalan um, referendum that, that she has described so well. Again, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to be quite brief. But I mean, what I can advance is that my my argument is largely that I think the intense political conflict um, that led to the referendum um, affected, I believe, politicized the judicial process that followed. And I believe that the outcome of this process is still currently um, creating significant difficulties, I think for finding any type of negotiated solution to, to the process today. So as I'm sure um, everyone here with interest in this um, will know, the referendum process that um, Mireya described was followed by a slightly ambiguous declaration of independence by Carlos Puigdemont. Um, ambiguous because it was declared, but at the same time it was suspended, so it was largely largely um, symbolic. This led to a period of uncertainty, but then to a kind of very um, strong and I would argue largely disproportionate um, response by the Spanish authorities. This had sort of two, two branches, two arms to it. The first one was the suspension of Catalan autonomy under Article 55 of the Spanish Constitution. Again, I think this, this very strong response brought um, the state, the system 
into using legal instruments and provisions that had never been used before. So I think this also involved a certain degree of uncertainty over, over these provisions. One of these was Article 155 of the Constitution, which is an exceptional provision which enables um, the central authorities to intervene in relation to an autonomous community that isn't complying with the law, that isn't complying with with the constitution. So this is what the Spanish um, government proceeded to do with the support of the Senate as the kind of procedure requires. And basically the measures they adopted under this provision was the removal of the president and of the government, the dissolution of the Catalan parliament and the calling of new elections. And also then the um, control, the intervention of the kind of Catalan administration in the exercises of their competence. And this lasted for a period of about seven months. Both the necessity of the use of the Article 155 and also the legality of the actual measures adopted were contested, partly because um, a lot of the actions that had taken place had been largely symbolic, the Declaration of Independence had been largely symbolic, and also because of the breadth of, of the measures, there was some uncertainty because the article hadn't been applied before, but what was very strongly challenged was the fact that the Spanish authorities came in and dissolved the Catalan Parliament. However, this was challenged before the Constitutional Court, and the Constitutional Court said that no, that, that this was all legal and had been compatible with, with the Constitution. The second kind of arm of this very strong state response, again, as is well known, is the prosecution of the pro-independence leaders. So this involved civil society leaders, it involved the members of the government that remained in Spain, as is well known. The president, Carlos Puigdemont, and some of the members of his government left Spain. A lot of them went to Belgium. Clara Ponsetti, as I'm sure a lot of people here know, spent a time in Scotland. But those who remained were charged and controversially as well were put in pre-trial detention, as I said, controversially, because this measure, again, is an exceptional measure for people who are considered dangerous or um, if there's a kind of a risk of tampering with evidence. Or, again, there were a series of ex exceptional measures which tend to justify pre-trial detention, which it was hard to argue applied in, in this case because of, of the facts. Controversially also, and again, this is something that, that we can discuss, the initial charges that were brought against them included charges of disobedience, misuse of public funds, because the idea was funds had been used for the referendum, although this was never really um, clearly, clearly proved. But the most controversial charge that was brought against them for all these activities that, that led to the holding of the referendum was charges of um, rebellion. Again, this is a historical crime that is included in um, the Spanish Penal Code, but had not been applied um, before. Basically, um, the conduct included is a kind of violent and public uprising for a variety of ends, one of which is declaring the independence of a part of, of the country. And as I said, this is controversial because the construction of the argument to bring these charges against them was that, you know, the Catalan leaders, the leaders of the independence movement, by holding the referendum, knew that this was something illegal and therefore knew that the Spanish state would have to respond strongly as it did, and the images of police brutality, I'm sure, are um, well known to everybody here. So this, this argument basically made them responsible for this violence, for the violence that followed, because they should have known that th this was what, what, would have, what would have followed their, their actions. There is, and I've mentioned already, disobedience. There is, I would argue, a clear um, other type of crime in the criminal code. So the crime of disobedience in public office, which basically penalizes um, the refusal to comply, for example, with legality or with judicial um, decisions when someone is in, in public office. I would argue that the different leaders, when they went ahead with the process, probably acknowledged that um, they would maybe be prosecuted for what was going on, but this seemed to be the expectation this seemed to be the framework which would ordinarily a state would respond to this type of conduct. Obviously, 
um, the potential um, sentences that can follow these two different crimes are, are very different. For rebellion, um, individuals can be sentenced to up to 25 years, while for um, disobedience, it's three to 12 months of a fine and then a period of being banned from um, public office. The trial went ahead, as it was well known, it took place in the Supreme Court. This was also um, interesting to watch from the perspective that usually we have these kind of debates on self-determination, on autonomy, on democracy, because these were the strong arguments that were put forward by um, the accused and, and their representatives. Usually these take place in the constitutional court. This is the natural place for debates on what the constitution allows and doesn't and what the appropriate processes are for these um, debates to, to take place. So again, there was a strong contrast in the Supreme Court in the trial that took place and lasted various weeks between um, these arguments that we put forward and the very strong criminal law kind of constructed arguments that we put forward by, by the, the prosecution. An interesting point to highlight, and I see that, that I, I am um, running out of time, but again, I'll, I'll stress the most important thing, is that during this period, and I'm not going to talk so much um, about the politics, I know Danny's coming back to this, there was a change in, in government, and the new government that came in that was less um, strong-handed in its response to, to the process, the new government that came in actually changed the government lawyers. There was a prosecution from the independent prosecution service that was prosecuting for rebellion, but they changed the government lawyer because they refused to change their charges to a lower um, crime of sedition. So the new position of the government and the government lawyer was charged for, for sedition. This is similar to the crime of rebellion, but it um, doesn't have this element of, of violence. So it involves kind of tumultuous and public uprising. And ultimately, this was the, the crime that was largely um, chosen by the court. So this was the outcome of the case for many of the most important participants who were then sentenced to nine, from nine to 13 years in in jail. Briefly, because I'm aware that, that I'm running out of time, I think even despite kind of taking the lower of the two most serious crimes, this raises a lot of serious concerns, for example, about the application now of this new criminal charge to case involving freedom of assembly, of freedom of, of expression. And I believe also that this court decision, the arguments that were used, are now complicating the situation for trying to find a negotiated sol solution to, to the conflict. And just to end briefly on, on this, I know Danny's gonna talk about the political aftermath, but what we have now is a legalization of the different possible options to reach some kind of solution. So the government itself, as I said, this new government that is a less kind of strong armed majority is itself talking about reforming the crime of secession and rebellion. So these crimes that were used as a way to um, reduce the sentence of the individuals that are still in jail and as a way um, to avoid these negative consequences of how, how it has been used. They are also considering a pardon for them, which is a process that has been raised and is being considered. This is a decision of, of the government. Um, which is a, a political decision. However, some of the individuals who have been jailed have already said that they wouldn't accept a pardon, that they don't believe that they have committed a crime, so they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept a pardon. And the third option that is being put forward, in this case by the pro-independent leaders, is requesting an amnesty law. So the way they see the solution, this situation that can be resolved, you know, the outcome of this really disproportionate response for, for the state is, is an outcome. Finally, I think also an important point to highlight regarding the disproportionate response of, of the state is that, well, I suppose the third arm or the third kind of type of mechanisms that the Spanish authorities have been trying to use is the European arrest warrant to try and get Puigdemont or some of the other um, 
political um, prisoners who are either in Belgium or in other um, states to return. No state has yet accepted to return any of these individuals under the European arrest warrant for these very serious crimes that they're being charged with. And currently, as Puigdemont and the others are members of the European Parliament, this is something that's being considered by the European Parliament. Thanks. I think I'll stop here and sorry if I went on a bit too long. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. So this is our third and final presentation of the briefing from Danny. Danny, jump in. Thank you, Liam. And thank you, Alizanda and Mireya, for your insights. Uh, I would like to focus on three main points about the political consequences of the 2017 independence referendum. Uh, and the first one that I would like to talk about are the divisions within pro-independence parties, which have intensified over the past two or three years. And the main line of division is between pragmatists, those who defend to engage in political dialogue with Madrid while building internal support for independence, which incidentally has been the Achilles heel of the movement for a long time, the inability to achieve a clear and sustained support for independence within Catalonia that surpasses 50%. So those would be the pragmatists and then the, the maximalists, those who would uh, defend continued disobedience, although it is not always clear how they would go about it. Uh, Esquerra, which is the ideological equivalent of the SNP, is leading the pragmatist strategy, while Carles Puigdemont's Junts per Catalunya, and to a lesser degree, the far left coup, are uh, leading the uh, maximalist strategy. And I think this point of a significant difference with Scotland. In Catalonia, we see two pro-independence parties of roughly the same size, one center left and one center right, and they compete against each other in terms of leadership, in terms of strategy, and so on. Uh, and this is very different to the Scottish situation in which the SNP, although it's not the only pro-independence party in the Scottish Parliament, controls and dominates timing and the case for independence uh, comfortably. And indeed, this competition between these two main pro-independence parties in Catalonia has accelerated the independence agenda in the past few years and has eventually led to the unilateral uh, decisions in 2017. In fact, divisions and mistrust between these two parties are precede actually the 2017 referendum. They were less explicit. After all, they joined forces in 2015 indeed together for yes coalition which won the election that year but did not obtain a majority of the popular vote and that mixed result eventually led to the holding of the referendum in 2017. Uh, since the referendum these divisions have intensified as these two parties compete electorally and also because they offer fundamentally different interpretations and views about what the 1st of October 2017 meant. Uh, it, and I think in, here it's important to stress two issues. Perhaps the first one, a fundamental disagreement, is one on, on the mandate and whether the referendum of the 1st of October, even though it was boycotted by unionists and it was not agreed with the central government, resulted in a clear and decisive mandate for independence. And the second one has to do with the interpretation of the event. For some people, and indeed for some leaders, that referendum was indeed an exercise in self-determination. But for many others, and particularly for, for some at the top at the moment, it was, an, it was an attempt to gain leverage and to force the Spanish government to sit and talk, as they say, to negotiate uh, this issue and to channel politically. So it was an instrumental use of a referendum that was uh, seen there too. Uh, it seems to me that we are still seeing that pro-independence parties are still coming to grips with the failure of the 2017 independence agenda. They're still adapting to the circumstances. And this is all happening in a context in which successive judicial blows have weakened the leadership of the independence movement and their ability to craft new strategies. Indeed, it's been a constant feature of the Catalan crisis that judges, courts, and so on have played a very prevalent role in the evolution 
of the dispute of the Catalan question. Uh, and we have very recent examples, uh, the Supreme Court banning Catalan President uh, Kim Torra from public office. And just today, there was a police operation led by a Barcelona court in which the Guardia Civil has arrested pro-independence strategists and business people for misuse of public funds and other charges. So that's the end of my first point. It's overall, this is a moment of, of division and a moment of introspection for the Catalan independence uh, movement, even though it's been three years since the referendum. My second point has to do with development in, in Madrid. Uh, and this touches upon something that Alisenda mentioned at the end, that the new government is adopting a more appeasing approach to the Catalan question, uh, but the way forward is, is not clear. Uh, the Spanish government, Spanish socialists, sorry, formed a, a coalition government with Unidas Podemos last year, and Esquerra Republicana abstained from the investiture to allow the formation of the government. And this prompted the socialists to adopt this more appeasing tone after running a fairly tough election campaign in November last year on the Catalan issue, emphasizing issues of law and order, characterizing the Catalan movement as violent, and in a way buying into some of the arguments and frames of the Spanish right because they were trying to uh, compete electorally with uh, the party Ciudadanos. Uh, however, the reality is that the socialists continue to oppose uh, a referendum. Podemos, the smaller uh, party in this coalition, supports it, but they have toned down their commitment to, to the referendum in Catalonia. A bilateral table between the Spanish and Catalan governments was set up in February, although it has been characterized by paralysis, which is partly explained by the pandemic. And reaching an agreement won't be easy since the positions are very far apart. Uh, the Spanish government is unlikely to agree on a self-determination referendum, while accommodating measures that fall short of a referendum will be denounced immediately by the Spanish right as, and the Spanish media as a concession to the separatists. And also the Esquerra Republicana will be under pressure from the other independence party to not agree on anything that falls short of holding a referendum and an amnesty law. At the same time, even though the Spanish government's engagement with the Catalan question has been episodic, uh, it is now considering a presidential pardon, as Alisenda mentioned, for Catalonia's jailed pro-independence leaders. And this measure would see them released from jail, which would be arguably a first step in the path towards reconciliation. Uh, however, this falls short of the of Catalan independent supporters' demand, which is to an amnesty law that nullifies last year's Supreme Court verdict. So I'm, I'm reaching the end of my second point here about the political situation in Madrid and the new government. Uh, it seems to me that in the absence of decisive political leadership on both sides, the courts and the judges will continue to play too large a role in the evolution of this dispute. And every new judicial blow is a challenge for Asquerra to persevere in the pragmatist uh, agenda and in the pragmatist strategy. The third and final point I wanted to make very briefly is about the future. What's next? And what's next is a Catalan election in February, only three months before the next Scottish election at Holyrood. Uh, and it will be important to see what party, what strategy, what leadership emerges as the dominant one within Catalan nationalism and within the Catalan pro-independence movement. Esquerra is ahead in the polls, but only by a small margin. And certainly they would not be in a position to uh, govern alone. They would need to form a coalition with other parties. and. In fact, Esquerra and Junts per Catalunya are already in campaign mode, and I would expect the run-up to the election to be bitter and to be a fierce competition between them to see who wins the election and who manages to uh, achieve the presidency uh, again. Junts will probably try to emphasize the national agenda, although this may prove difficult in the current pandemic situation, while Ascara is likely to combine the national and the social agenda, perhaps paving the way for a renewal of the 
tripartite coalition government that, run, that governed Catalonia between 2003 and 2010 with uh, the Catalan Socialists and the Catalan Greens. I'll, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That were, those were three excellent presentations. Um, we've had some questions in, so thank you very much to everyone who has sent some. And I think we can probably overrun a little bit here just because we were a little bit delayed in starting. So as long as our, our speakers are still able to hang around, we can probably get through a few of the questions. Um, we had one sent in just before, um, just before the event started. So I'll go with that first. The question was, has support for Catalan secession reduced since the referendum? If so, what actions by the Spanish government can be said to have led to this reduced support? I don't know who, if anyone would like to come into that first. Maybe Maria, are you able to answer that question? Yep. Okay, I mean, it's what it comes to my mind. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer from a scientific point of view, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> first of all, it's been three very intense years in which if independence is linked to a referendum, we see that that's a very, very difficult um, end to achieve. So that could be one thing. Another thing is the, the huge level of stress, judicial, and the use of police force that has impact on the Catalan uh, population. I mean, I know that uh, that can seem a bit an exaggeration, but some time ago, just after the referendum, I mean, after seeing and, and being there with the police actions, I was listening to a radio program on Martha Gellhorn, who was a Hemingway wife, and she was a war correspondent, but she retired to Wales. And when there were the miners' strikes, she was absolutely terrified by the action of the police after seeing so many wars. So imagine, I mean, that was something that had an impact on the perception of what to do. I'm not saying that it's the principal aspect, but the use of violence is something that can explain partly that some people that were not very intensively supporting the referendum or the independence would think, well, I mean, there are other things. Also, the tiredness of three years of mobilization. I mean, that the, the huge support of people in demonstration is something completely um, out of normal. But it has to be understood that after three years, I mean, the level of mobilization, it's a bit now low. And as well, I mean, not having a right-wing party in central government, um, maybe the ways I mean, or maybe the, the PP was also promoting, in a way, the, 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 the idea there was no alternative but independence. I mean, with a socialist government that, uh, at least on the surface, is trying to reach an agreement and finding or defining the solution towards uh, the political one, helps to or provides some of the people who were not so so intensive in favor to think that uh, okay there is another way so that's just this thinking quickly what do you think I could be I don't know one I see Danny Singh doing yeah, this I so I hope to <laughs> read the agreement of my political scientist <laughs> Danny would you like to contribute um yeah on, on the specific issue of public support for independence I would maybe say that it, it does fluctuate a little bit, but it's remarkably stable. It's true that there have been several uh, polls indicating a slight decline in support for independence over the past few months, although there was one last week which showed that support for independence was again around 45%, which is a figure that people in Scotland would be familiar with because for many years, perhaps between 2014 and now, support for independence has also been around 45%. Now it's over 50% in Scotland. So to me, this is an interesting point that in Catalonia, support for independence over the past six years seems to be relatively unaffected by very significant political development. We've had, as Mireia and Alizenda mentioned, we've had direct rule, we've had violence, episodes of violence on the 1st of October, uh, all sorts of issues, a, a unilateral declaration of independence, 
and yet support for independence and opposition to independence have been quite static. Uh, so I think that's an interesting, an interesting point. Uh, on the particular issue of uh, a point that Mireya mentioned, I, I would agree, and I think that's a similarity with Scotland, a general one, that there are, in Spain, there are sometimes conservative governments at the center, which tend to be unpopular in sub-state nation in Catalonia and Scotland, and that perhaps creates an incentive for looking for alternative political routes, while there may be more center-left conservative government at the center that tend to tend to adopt a more uh, appeasing and accommodating position on territorial and national questions. Can I just ask quickly, is there a demographic aspect to this? In Scotland, there's often a feeling that um, younger people are more likely to probably side towards independence. To what extent does that apply in Catalonia? I think younger generations are more um, in favour of independence. It's true that um, it's that, that if you look at the demographical pyramid, yes, that's the, the problem. All the problem. The problem is that there were a lot of people that couldn't vote at that time. I don't know. Maybe now it would be different. But they extended the the age uh, at sixteen, I think, at the referendum, right? And so, or not? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, correct, yeah. yeah. So yes, I mean. That, that also brings another argument that, uh, that the right-wing parties at Spanish level say that the schools are a focus of uh, creating <laughs> for independent ch uh, children. So it's also a situation in this that, uh, yes, um, it generates a okay. lot of, of discussions on issues that don't have any relation to. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alessandra, you have your hand up. Are you, are you, would you like to come in? Um, it was briefly, yeah, can you hear me? I don't know if Danny maybe wants to come back to the, the demographic. I just wanted to make a, a brief comment on on the support for independence and in response to some of the comments that I see coming up in the chat, which I can't resist looking at about the lessons learned from, from the process, maybe, for example, for, for Scotland, because I mean, obviously, Scotland is, is in a very um, different situation uh, at the moment, although parallels can be drawn in, in certain circumstances. But I think, and, and just just briefly, I would say lesson learned, one one would be about the, the dangers, the need for cautious about looking for alternative paths for, for um, holding a referendum, because something that hasn't come up, but I think is important to think about, is that despite the Spanish authorities' very, very strong and disproportionate response, it has largely been accepted by the European Union, by the international sphere, by other states. There's not been the kind of outrage that you might expect um, of response to to a referendum. But on the other hand, I think the ongoing support for independence, I think, is also a warning for, um, you know, wider states. So in this case, maybe for, for the UK government of saying, you know, even with the response such as the Catalan one, where they sent in the police, where they suspended autonomy, where they, you know, prosecuted the leaders and sent them for jail for many, many years. The, the issue continues to be one that's at the center of the political and constitutional debate. So this isn't a way to make the, the problem go away. So that was the comment I wanted to make. OK, I, I actually have a quick follow up on that one, but I think Danny might want to come in quickly on the demographics. No, I mean, let, let's address the other questions. OK. So the, the next one that we have, um, well, that I've found in the chat anyway, is does the Spanish government's handling of the situation represent a failure to deal with it from a constitutional and political perspective rather than recourse to the criminal law? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to address that. And I think definitely, I mean, this is a process. Obviously, we only covered the 2017 referendum, which arguably was the result of many other different attempts by the Catalan authorities to hold referendums in a way that was compatible with the constitution, to hold consultations that weren't referendums, to reach some kind of agreement. At the beginning there was a debate you know, about putting other options on the question that would be kind of options for more autonomy. So this is the result of a very long process and really just a refusal to even engage with the with the issue from the Spanish authorities and just challenging everything initially before the constitutional court and even the constitutional court at a certain point said we can't resolve this political conflict this has to be resolved by the political branches of government obviously the response that we saw to the 2017 referendum because all these issues had already been discussed in the constitutional court and the constitutional court said okay we're saying they're not compatible with the constitutional 
this is when criminal law got involved, the criminal law system, and I think that that became even more problematic. Does anyone else want to come in now? Yeah, I mean, if I could just add to that, I completely agree with everything Alexander just said, and I, I think it's interesting in the Spanish case to distinguish between different factors that prevent a negotiated referendum from happening. One of them is certainly ideational. It's about the way political elites in Spain understand the political union, and they tend not to understand it as a union, but as a single nation, one state, one nation, and, and therefore territorial integrity uh, plays a very significant role. Perhaps in the UK, although there are many forms of unionism and it's constantly changing, the very concept of a union suggests different territories, and that has been interpreted by UK politicians, or some of them, across time as involving the right to self-determination, although for a while it did not involve the right to uh, devolution or political autonomy. So it's a bit different. The, the, the conception of the union of the state is a bit different, and that prevents uh, certain more appeasing uh, options. Indeed, Podemos is the only party that talks about a plurinational state, and they are a smaller party in the coalition government. Second point, very briefly, is about the constitution. Obviously, Article 2 enshrines the divisible unity of the Spanish nation, common homeland of all Spaniards, and that will always be there, even though many constitutional lawyers, and I know Alexander has worked on this, have talked and uh, analyzed different ways around it. And the third one, I think, is about strategy. And that was a crucial factor in, I think, in David Cameron's decision in, to engage with the Edinburgh Agreement in 2012. And that's something that has always been missing in the Spanish context. There is very little uh, political incentive for any party in government in Madrid to engage in a negotiation to hold a referendum on independence. At the time, in, in, in Scotland, support for independence was around 20 23%. And perhaps the thinking from London was that it could be easily won, and mm -hmm. that we won, but it wasn't easy. And uh, and in Spain, it, there's just very little incentive given the the support for independence, but also all the conceptual and constitutional issues that I was mentioning earlier. Mm. I think that taps into one of the questions that someone raised actually about a sense of insecurity, maybe in the in the central government over the prospect. And I certainly think the point you make about David Cameron is probably right. I think he, he thought that would have been a much easier referendum to win than it turned out to be. Um, okay, here's another one. Is there a general acceptance among the Catalan electorate that a constitutionally acceptable resolution of the current impasse is prerequisite to further moves towards independence? Um, Mireya, do you want to come in there? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's showing in all polls that um, although the, there's no clear majority on pro-independence, it's very, it's a, there's a huge consensus that there should be a political solution to the problem and that the referendum could be one mechanism to reach such a, such a solution. So you, you see that... Um, Probably that was an opportunity that the pro-independence uh, promoters uh, missed, is that um, there is a, a huge consensus even among people who didn't turn to vote on the 1st of October, that there's a political problem, and the political problem has to be solved with a political instrument. Whether it's a political negotiation that settles a referendum, or some of the people, a referendum from scratch. So that's something that um, I think we should <laughs> promote the idea that uh, that's a large consensus in, in Catalonia. I mean, of course, there are extremes that they're not you know, in favor of that. But um, yes, that's answering quickly, yes. <laughs> Would anyone else like to come in there? Okay. Uh, so the next one is, how has the pandemic changed things? In Scotland, the now is not the time quote that I pulled out at the start from Theresa May, that was in reference to the fact we were too busy with Brexit. Um, now there's a kind of general assumption that we're too busy dealing with COVID to try and, you know, potentially organise an independence referendum. Nicola Sturgeon faces criticism for that. In a Spanish or Catalan context, how has it affected the relationship between the different governments? And how has it changed the constitutional preferences? That could be for anyone, really. Elisenda, do you want to come in? 
Well, I mean, I think th th there were two, maybe we can distinguish between two broad responses from the Spanish government to, to this situation and this pandemic. The first one uh, was more centralist in nature. That was the one we experienced in March and April, in which the central government took a full direct control of the decisions that had to be implemented. And that's a significant difference from the response in the UK over, this, over these few months. And that prompted a response from the Catalan government, in which you will not be surprised to hear, and also the Basque government, asking for the competences to be returned to the autonomous communities so that they could implement, according to the Catalan government, more strict measures than the ones that were uh, initially proposed by the Spanish government. The second way in which this has been approached more recently has been a little bit different. It has stressed coordination between the different autonomous communities. It has not imposed one direct command from Madrid, uh, and it has not recentralized all these competences. And therefore, the Catalan government in this case has been a, in a position to make some decisions. Uh, a key test was to prove how competent the Catalan government was going to be, and if it was going to be more competent than the Spanish government. That's a matter for interpretation. In my view, there are mixed results, to put it generously, because the Catalan government was late in responding to some outbreaks in Lleida and other parts over the summer. And more recently, especially over the past few days, there have been very mixed messages to the population about what they should do next and what the new measures are. So I think there's a point here, there's a general idea, the sense of professionalism that perhaps Nicola Sturgeon and some SNP leaders convey in their press conferences is not something that we are seeing replicated in Catalonia in mm -hmm. at this moment in time, at least according to my interpretation of, of this. Lucinda, can you, is your audio in now? Can you, can you, can you hear yeah. me now? Sorry, I think I muted myself before and then for some reason no, my, um, my camera refused to, to unmute itself. No, I mean, I think Danny explained it very well. What I was going to say was I'm similar that we have seen these sort of attempts at divergences to approach. And there was at a time a real conflict where Catalonia wanted to sort of close its borders and really impose stronger measures. And this created real tensions with with the central authorities um, because of this. So so we have seen these these tensions. Can I ask, has, has there been a, an opposition party, a party opposed to Catalan independence, that has managed to navigate this debate without being sucked into it? It's, I'm thinking of Scottish Labour here, really, because the SNP and the Scottish Tories have both reacted to constitution-dominating discourse quite successfully, whereas Scottish Labour is a party that's not particularly interested in talking about constitution traditionally in the same way anyway. Are there any lessons for a party like that? Or, you know, you mentioned Podemos earlier. I would maybe think of the Comuns political space, which includes the Catalan branch of Podemos and includes the Catalan Greens. They have been the ones who at least have tried uh, to break the plebiscitary nature of the 2015 election, for example, and the ones who position themselves in favor of a negotiated ref referendum but against independence, while all, all the other unionist parties at the moment position themselves against a referendum and against independence. So if I had to identify one, it would probably be this party. Traditionally, it would have been the Catalan Socialists, who only in 2012 supported a referendum but opposed independence. Uh, but they have lost their more Catalanist voters in this process of political polarization that we've experienced in Catalonia. They've lost most of their Catalan voters to other more Catalan nationalist parties and the voters that they have kept are more pro-union and and that has prompted the party to align in the uh, in the more unionist stance together with Ciudadanos and the PP and others although always keeping a degree of ambivalence and not adopting the hardline discourse that the PP and Ciudadanos have adopted and, and just a final point that the Danos could be seen as the equivalent of the Scottish Conservatives after the referendum in the sense that they, they are the ones who have capitalized on <clears throat> the polarization around the issue of independence. They are the ones who have 
captured most of the unionist vote in a context in which the union uh, is put into question. Yeah, I think they have. We have a problem. Well, not the problem, but one of the the, the dimensions that would explain this is the left wing parties are very adverse to diversity. Let's say that um, they, 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 for them, it's very difficult to manage the two principles of um, a federal state, which is self-government and also diversity. If you see the, the, the left wing press in Madrid, I mean, there are articles saying um, that as a problem that in some autonomous communities, uh, the the policies are different from others, and if you live in this country, in this autonomous community, you will have less social um, um, services than if you live in, in another one. So all these makes very difficult. I mean, from from their mind to accept that there are other principles apart from universal universal ones. So I mean, I've been approached by several people from very left wing parties looking at the pro-independence um, movement as a wrong because, not because of moral issues, but because it's not uh, integrated in the principles of universality that, in theory, left-wing uh, movement will have. So I think partly is this is the division, this tension they have between seeing that something probably or, or the pro-independence movement it's it's legitimate, but at the same time, um, thinking that's morally not um, not good. I don't know if I explain myself, but I think it's these parties that are, are exactly in this position find themselves very difficult in very difficult situation to agree with themselves. Hmm. No, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're actually we're almost out of time for the end of the session. Um, I think we've probably just time for one last point each. If anyone has anything that they would like to add, or if you just want to address the general title of the of the briefing, which is really if there are any lessons for um, for other independence movements, not necessarily in Scotland. But if there's anything that each of you would like to add, this would be a great way to end it. I think. It, it seems to me that the Catalan experience offers a cautionary tale about unilateral referendums because it shows that they may be subject to boycott from unionists within the sub-state nation itself and that renders the referendum of the uh, the result of the referendum sorry to be put into question and that that doesn't necessarily lead into a, a significant clear political outcomes it also fosters divisions within uh, political parties and within parties advocating for independence between and within parties uh, but there's also a lesson, as Lisenda mentioned earlier, for the UK government as well, that uh, just uh, continuing to deny the issue will not make it go away, and that there's a need to engage politically with it. Uh, so there are, I think there are significant lessons, uh, accepting that each case has its own dynamics and its own internal logics. I think there are general lessons. Overall, I would maybe stress that the Catalan experience suggests that unilateral uh, ways of holding referendums are challenging, are not without problems, and may not ne necessarily solve the issue at stake. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, Elisenda, would you like to come in? I know you've touched on this already a bit. But... Um, yeah, yeah um, briefly maybe to present in a slightly different perspective and maybe to, to link it to Scotland, because I think this is probably what is kind of at the back of of everyone's mind, I think, <laughs> and, and agree with everything that Danny said, I think I think there's an argument of caution and an argument of taking these things slowly. It comes back to this legitimacy that Mireille was talking about at the beginning, the need for a really broad base, for a need for a really broad support. And I think it's important to think also that in contrast with Spain and in Scotland, we're a very different situation because we have the president of the 2014 referendum. So the UK government can't say, no, you can't hold an independent referendum within the UK constitutional framework, which was always, you know, the Spanish authorities with strong position of saying we can't let you do this in scotland that's not possible so arguments have to be put forward you know now is not the time is the you know the once in the generation all these it's more of a discussion so i think in in the scottish case it's also 
yet not clear yet if the Scottish Parliament has or not the competence to hold a unilateral referendum. That's another question that is open. Obviously, then you'd have the issue of of recognition. So I think the differences stand out as much as the as the similarities. And I think this is also an, an important thing to to take into account when thinking how to proceed in in the Scottish case with this ongoing support that seems to be growing for for the referendum. You know, the fact that the context is is significantly different in a way that favours, I think, Scotland in this sense. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I think probably opinion shifted there a little bit within the independence movement from maybe some people that were a little bit hardliner who now see some hope on the horizon if, if they consider a referendum hope, obviously. Um, Mireya, would you like to, to close us off here? Is there anything that you'd like to add? Or is there any lessons we can take? Mm, no, I mean, as a, as a lessons, I think, yeah, understanding the departing point is important, the institutional in, in the departing point you have. Because if you have to carry on a unilateral referendum, it means that if you want it to be successful, either because of the result brings you to independence or either because you want to use it as a bluff to negotiate, you have to measure very well uh, the effort, institutional and social effort you need to invest in order to achieve one of the two points. So the departing points are different. Probably Scotland has, as Lisanne has said, I mean, already uh, some background, but also, I, and I don't know, they, you already have the electoral administration under your powers. That makes a big difference if you can mm. control the electoral role. We, we, we don't. So it adds uh, institutional mm. factors that you have to go through. So I think that's that's also an important, I mean, lesson to really measure your forces and the effort, because you know that if it's unilateral, you will have a state against using all resources that they have, which are all, in order to stop it. Mm. So that's my conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. That was a fantastic. Um insight into the into the similar similarities and the parallels and the differences as well um i'm sorry you missed my opening part that was entirely in catalan um <laughs> that's a shame for you that you didn't hear that but it was fluent too um so it's just really left to me to thank you very much for your time i'm sure everyone that's um watching from home is applauding you in their living rooms so thank you very much for joining us it was an excellent event i hope everyone has a great evening <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for sharing, <laughs> everybody. Thanks.